I admit that this one is more speculative than most of the stuff I do on this channel. But I, I think it is important because it shows the power of the Christ-centered model for early Genesis and how if you look at Near Eastern mythology, like the Apkalu, the seven sages, if you look at that through the Christ-centered model, it fits together very well. And you can see how, wait a minute, one is a distorted version of the other. And we can argue about which was which, which came first. And, you know, I, I argue that the, the first chapters of Genesis were something that was old even in Moses' day. Moses wasn't writing from a blank slate. He had tablets that were from his ancestors who were from that same region where Assyria was, where Akkad was, where the Sumerians were. And so they had stories that tie in together. And I want to show how they can tie in together if you look at things through the Christ-centered model. And that means that Adam is not the first man. I'm not going to prove that here. I do it in my book. I have other videos. Adam, his job is not to be the father of humanity. His job is to be the father of the line of Messiah and to prepare the world and bring Messiah into the world. And as such, he was placed in a garden by God. He was given access to special knowledge. He was A lot of this had to do with agriculture and good seed and sort of every tree pleasing for food was given to him along with animals, domesticated animals that were uh, probably better versions. I don't even know if the world had domesticated animals when God formed Adam in this view, but if they did, Adam got better versions and sort of gave things a jump start. Maybe man had tried to domesticate anim animals before and except for the dog or something, it didn't work out well and it was one of those things touch and go and the improved breeds that man was able to get in this region. And if you look in history, sheep, pigs, cows, goats, maybe horses, they all start in that same region. It's the border between Syria and Turkey, Southern Turkey, Southeast Turkey and that area. And I'm one who holds to a northern location for the Garden of Eden. Look where Gobekli Tepe is. Very near to that. Somewhere in that area. So let's look and see if we can tie the patriarchs of Genesis chapter 5 into the seven sages of Sumerian and Akkadian myth, the Apukali. Typical depiction of an Apkalu. And... I've seen lots of sources that describe them as half human, half fish sort of beings that were, you know, look very alien, some of the ancient alien stuff. And I think they oversell it. The many accounts have them coming from the waters, but it's either the waters of the river or the waters of the Abzu, the underground which was a sacred space, you know, the underground waters that they drew fresh water from in, in southern Mesopotamia and helped them grow their crops. And so I, I don't buy that they were non-human looking, uh, half fish, half men. Here we see a picture, and this is very common in the way they look. They have like a helmet and a cloak that looks like has scales of a fish and maybe a fish's tail on it. And so you know, if someone knows how to do, I don't know, a cloak of armor plates that look like fish's scales and they get a little artsy with it. And that's kind of what it looks like. It looks like a guy who's wearing a fish helmet and a fish cape for armor. And some depictions of the Apkalu don't even have them as with fish heads, but with bird heads and, and with wings. And that was another sort of sacred place. You know, in Genesis, when it says God made the birds, he made them to fly before the face of heaven. This, this place between earth and heaven, he made the birds to live in that area. And so that is very much what the sages were like. They were supposed to take knowledge from the gods and bring it to the earth. And so that, that kind of fits with this version of the Apkalu of being descendants of Adam 
who came down and showed the rest of mankind in that region. They just sailed down the river and showed them a better way to live, a more civilized way to live. And so, and notice that handbag the guy is carrying. That is a very common feature. I'm going to show you another one where they have fish heads, and, or, and I'll show you one they have bird heads. And they'll, they'll all still be carrying that same bag. Dispensing knowledge of the gods, water, we don't know. But that symbol is very prominent. I'm, I'm going to show you something amazing. Look at this next one. Okay, so we, we see a picture on one side, an Apkalu, who does have a bird's head and has wings. And that's the other common depiction that they have. I, I think if you were near Assyria, it tended to be more with a bird's head. And if you were down and where the rivers are drained to the ocean in Iridu or southern Mesopotamia, they went more with the fish armor in their depictions. But either way, whether it's fish or birds, it's associated with a sacred space. But look at the bag in that Apkalu's hand. And he's, by the way, he's tending a sacred tree. So that is also a common theme in ancient Near Eastern mythology is the ancient tr is the uh, sacred tree I, I, and i in course that you wonder about is that sort of a, a derivation of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil but look at this the pillar number 43 an enclosure i forget whether it's c or d but from gobekli tepe now they don't it's not being held by a figure but those symbols are the same symbols that this bird-headed Apkalu has in his hand, and the previous example of the fish cloak and fish helmeted Apkalu has in his hand. Same symbol. And Gobekli Tepe is supposed to be, I don't think it's quite this old. I, I've looked into the dating. I think they've dated it in such a way that they can only get a maximum age and that it's, it's two or 3,000 years younger than they think but still much older than Iron Age Assyria. This symbol has been around for a long time. And I didn't bother to download an image and, and put it in here, but this same symbol has been found in Mesoamerica, on the other side of the world, in some of their stone monuments. So there is some sort of underlying theme here, and I don't know what it is, and I, I hope the experts solve it, solve it. It's fascinating, but my point here is that this has a long history. This isn't something that the Sumerians and the Assyrians or the Akkadians came up with in 1000 BC or 2000 BC. These symbols have been around for a long, long time. Now take a look at this frieze. It has the ancient Akkadian god, Ea, and the Sumerians had another name for him, but the Akkadians were the ones that, like Akkad was a descendant of Noah. In other words, in this Christ-centered model where there were men besides Adam, there were men that survived the flood besides Adam because the flood was about extinguishing the line of Messiah that had gone corrupt. It wasn't about wiping out all humans, all plants, and all animals. It was about, it was the, it was the story of Frankenstein's monster, basically Dr. Frankenstein had a moral obligation to destroy his creation because it was messing up the wider world. And that's kind of what happened with uh, the story of the flood. So, and I know you may be thinking, oh, gee, I can, I, I can think of five scriptures right off the top of my head that show that that can't be true. I once thought so too. You really don't. And I talk about it in other videos. I talk about it in the book, but you really have to dive into the text to see it. But for, for now, I'm asking you to just go with me and understand that other people survived the flood. I mean, it said when they got off the boat, the clans of Noah, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. So the ark landed east, they came in there, and then they said the whole earth was of one language or, or one tongue. And then they said... Uh, let's build a city so we don't get scattered over the whole earth. Well, if they were not over the whole earth, then how could the whole earth be speaking one tongue if they were, if that's all, all the people there were. 
there were other people around. That's kind of what the Babel account is implying. When, when they say, let's build a city and make a name for ourselves. Well, who are they trying to impress if they're the only people? I've got another video on that. But the point is that you, you have this, uh, the, the God, Iah, that is pronounced like the first two syllables of the Tetragrammaton, of the sacred name for the God of the Bible. And it, it appears to me what has happened is that the Sumerians and the Akkadians, they did what humans do, and they changed the story so that they're not the bad guy. The gods are the bad guy. You know, that in, in the account of the flood, it was because of human sin that Iaue, see, it's the same Iaue, that is the Tetragrammaton as it should be pronounced. Some people call it Yahweh. It's that's a you know sort of a different thing where they don't emphasize the last two syllables. But my point is that Yah, which the Bible uses just those two syllables to name God many many times. Okay, he's the one who's friendly to humanity in Sumerian myth and Akkadian myth, and so he warns humanity that there's a flood coming and he warns a Noah like figure to build an ark. He's the good guy. And it was just because humans were making too much noise. It wasn't because in, in, in the Akkadian version, in the Assyrian version, it wasn't because we're so rotten and we know what, what do you think the truth is that human beings are rotten or that the gods created people and the noise got bothered them. So they decided to kill them all. I mean, it, it if we're honest with ourselves, the version of Genesis rings much more true. So, but it wasn't all of humanity. It was the line of Messiah that God was displeased in and was trying to extinct. The, the versions uh, from the Akkadians and the Assyrians later, you know, because they got a glancing blow from all of these floods, it, it affected their stories too. And then when the sons of Noah came out of the hills, they tied it all together. So here you have... Uh, the, the one God, and they had to change the story and say, well, now, we're not blaming us anymore. We're blaming capricious gods, but we got to have a good guy, God. We still, God did warn someone to build an ark and bring all the animals and preserve life. So we got to have a good guy, God. Well, let's just give him a brother who's the bad guy. And everything we don't like, we'll just ascribe to him. And that's where Inky comes in. So they basically... The same character in Genesis, he's holy and he's just. He wants to save Noah, but he's also just, and he wants to wipe out the unjust, everyone else in the clan of Adam. Well, they, they had the Assyrians and the Akkadians. They didn't make themselves the bad guy. They had to make, uh, they had to invent a God to make the bad guy and keep everything else an element in the same story. But look at how the, there's four rivers coming out of the shoulders of Iah. Does four rivers sound familiar to you? Yes. The Garden of Eden, where man, up in, uh, up in the mountains, I believe, where man and God dwelt together, was said to be located where either the mouth of four rivers or the source of four rivers, I think it was more the, closer to the source of four rivers, two of which are the Tigris and Euphrates, who really come very close together. Uh, if you consider their underground, the underground source of the Tigris, the closest the Tigris gets to the, to the Euphrates. So that, that hill country up there, Eden was somewhere up there. God was dwelling with men. And so he was up there, and the four rivers are flowing from his country to the rest of the world. And what are the Apkalu doing? They're tending things along one of the rivers. They're bringing the civilization that Ial wanted brought to man. So they, they had this special role. And let's say you're one of the sons of Adam, or you and your family are among the descendants of Adam, and you go down the river and you find these other people, and you bring your lifestyle with you, and, and they're hunter-gatherers still. So they're amazed when you come off this boat and you have prey animals dozens of them just following you around because they don't know about domesticated animals or 
how they have to go hunt nuts and berries and gather, and it's hard work. And you have this way of making mass quantities of berries just pop up in a very small space and all these good trees to eat. And you have all this insight on the stars and administrative things. And so these people are like demigods to you. I mean, this was very much the way a hunter-gatherer population would see a population that could do things like had domesticated animals, had cultivated crops, maybe they had uh, skill in metallurgy, making a cloak of scales or, or what have you. And so I, you can see it. It doesn't take much imagination to see that if there was a very privileged group in the hills that came down and showed these things to the other people, over time they would be deified. Right now we've got some coincidences that are general, but I want ones that are specific to make you go, hmm, yeah, that, that could work. I can see how over time, the, and, and when I talk about these sages, I, I'm not saying that the myths, the Assyrian, the Akkadian, the Sumerian myths, they're not true. They heard these names in history or they heard of stories of these figures in history and they made up the history. In other words, these seven sages were supposed to be advisors to kings in pre-flood cities like Eridu. And maybe some of them did give advice, but I don't know that it was uh, mechanistic or as tightly configured as it shows here. For example, Adapa makes sense as Adam, the first of the pre-flood sages, Uana or Anes, the pronunciation of the name differs, but I mean, even the pronunciation of the name Jesus differs. If you saw the Passion of the Christ, you know that the pronunciation of his name in his life was Yahshua. The first two syllables, the same two syllables of the name of God with the Hebrew word for salvation, Yah is salvation. So Adapa was a son of Ea in ancient Near Eastern myth, just like Adam was a son of God. Adapa was allowed to go before heaven and was offered food by Anu. Anu was like God the Father, or An is like God the Father, and Ea is like God the Son. And I, in early Genesis, the reveal cosmology. I do trace that where God the Father and God the Son, they are distinct characters even from early on in the account. It's very, very Trinitarian and very much in line with a Jewish view of thought that was a strong minority position in Judaism until it, Christianity came along. And then it sounded too much like Christianity, so they de the rabbis declared it a heresy. But that's the, the two powers of heaven idea if you want to research that so adapa goes in front of heaven and you know in the original adam and eve story it's because adam disobeyed god and took the fruit well they changed that around you can't have them being to blame we got to switch it to somehow it's god's fault so in this one ea advises adapa not to eat of the fruit because he suspects a trick and but but Anu or An changes his mind when he, and he decide, takes a liking to Adapa and offers him food that will give him immortality. But Adapa follows Ea's advice and says, No, that's okay, I don't want any, and misses out on it. And so you can see how it's kind of like a version of Adam and Eve, except uh, we completely blame shift, we, we do exactly what humans do. We completely blame shift and, and try to accuse the gods of, you know, being wrong when it's us. And really, the gospel and salvation, it, the story hasn't changed since the beginning of time, folks. It's are, are you going to admit that it's you and not God that's the problem, or are you going to are you going to keep changing the story to make it seem like it's his fault? That that just hasn't changed in thousands of years. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then there was, uh, it's called, or his epithet is 
who completed the plans of heaven and earth. That is the epitaph they give. Each, each one of these sages, they give a, a brief epitaph. And I, I wouldn't say that Adam finished that himself or personally, but he was the last part of that creation week where God had finished his work. He, he was, it was complete, and God saw that it was very good. So you could say, gee, that's strange. Uana, also known as Adapa, who also has a story where he loses immortality because of a divine food, has a very strong similarity to Adam in that Adam was the final work where, where, where God said it's very good. In other words, God's plan to initiate the line of Messiah, to bring mankind to uh, a reconciliation with himself, even though he's holy and we are not, even, even with us able to see our true nature, that plan had begun. So it was the, the ground, the foundation had been completed. It had been finished. So I, I, I see great similarities between Adapa or Iwana, how, whichever name you want, and Adam. Now, that's not true of the traditional view of Adam. He's missing. The traditional view of Adam, the rabbis hold, where is he in ancient Near Eastern literature? How did, if Genesis is really old, how did the other cultures miss seeing him as, as the father of the human race? Why don't they all say we descended from Adam? Well, because the Bible doesn't even teach that. The Bible would have Adam or his descendants very much like this from the perspective of peoples outside the garden. They would be sages somewhere between gods and men endowed with the knowledge of civilization. Uh, Adam was a son of God. He's identified in Luke as a son of God. As a figure of Christ, he would, he would need to be. So, so many connections there. Now, as you go on, the second one it said he was endowed with comprehensive intelligence. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting very speculative here, but his name sounds a whole lot like Uana, who is Adapa. And I would say that, that Seth, you know, was the son that was created in the image and the likeness of Adam. That's what Adam said about him. He said he had a son in his own image and his own likeness. So I don't, we don't have enough to go on from just that little bit of information. And as time goes on, I'm sure like there were probably more than seven main sages or probably more than seven that came down. I'm not saying these are like the first seven listed in Genesis chapter five. At some point, some of these might be Cain's sons, for example, or descendants of Cain. For instance, uh, the, the fourth one on the list, two, four, the fifth one on the list grew up on pasture land. You know, one of the sons of Cain was the father of those who live in tents and have herds and flocks that were sort of traveling pastoralists. So who knows? That, that could have been a remnant of him. Uh, but the fact is, there are seven of these, and the seventh one, it is said of him that he ascended to heaven. Now, it also Adapa also ascended to heaven, was a son of Ea, and was a friend. But who, does that ring a bell to you, the seventh who ascended into heaven? Doesn't Genesis chapter 5 have Enoch? Enoch the seventh from Adam. He walked with God for 300 years, and he was not, for God took him. And in the New Testament, they basically say he was translated. He didn't even see death. Sort of a foretaste or maybe a sample of what things could have been if Adam had not gone astray. So to me, that's, that's yet another coincidence. The seventh one on the list, on both lists, Genesis 5 and the Sumerian Kings list, have got the seventh one ascending into heaven. Now, does any of this prove that the seven pre-flood sages were sort of a memory of the clan of Adam coming out of the hills and bringing civilization to the ancient Near East? That is not by any means proof. It's something that I'm saying 
we need to look at, we need to study. It is very strange to me that so many domesticated animals can trace their origin back to that same place, and so many domesticated crops can trace their origin back to that same place that fits in the general region of a northern location for the Garden of Eden. And even the time frame, the time frame is a little bit variable. You could see my video about why uh, Bishop Usher's dates could only be a minimum, and the Septuagint's dates are 1,500 years or so older anyway. But the time frame that makes sense and in the place that makes sense, and while the traditional view of Adam is missing from ancient Sumerian, Akkadian, Near Eastern myth, the Christ-centered model version fits like a hand in a glove. You can see how it's the same story from the perspective of the natives that are getting uplifted uh, by this privileged clan. So I admit it is speculative. It is fascinating. I'm calling for more research, but you, you may or may not have to admit there's a lot of data points that could easily be connected. Thank you for listening and may God bless you.